right, time to check the weather now. Let's go to David Jones at Environment Canada. Thanks, Rick. Out here on the West Coast, we've got intermittent showers, some fog in low-lying areas. The temperature about 12 to 15 degrees, but we do expect some sunny breaks later in the day. Looks to me like another one of those Tony Onley days. In this part of the world, David, every day is a Tony Onley day. I'm a pretty much of a loner, you know, I, had, I live alone and, and fly alone. I was born on the Isle of Man, which is a sort of British protectorate. Um, but it's an independent country, it's in the Irish Sea. I was born there in 1928. My father was an actor and my mother was a mother. It's a wonderful place to grow up, you know, because there were very few distractions of any kind. So I had to sort of identify with my surroundings, identify with the island somehow, and painting seems to be an ideal thing to do. And, and I always painted, you know, right from the time I was a child at school. When I was about 13 or so, I started going painting with a John Hobbs Nicholson. He would go out with his favored students at the weekends, and I wanted to join that crowd. I wanted to go out painting with him. He was a very fine watercolor painter in a sort of a 19th century tradition, but I wanted to learn, you know, like the scales of a piano. I wanted to learn how to handle watercolor. But anyway, I asked him, I plucked up courage. I was only about 13. I said, you know, could I join you the weekend? You know, you cycle out manfully and do hairy-chested outdoor watercolors. I'd like to join you, you know. And he says, well, if you can keep up. I joined him and, um, uh, you know, I was probably his best pupil because, uh, you know, when it was, uh, the weather wasn't so good or it was cold and everybody else dropped out, I mean, John and I go off painting together. That sort of influenced my pattern of painting for the rest of my life, I think. I don't use a bicycle anymore, of course. You know, I don't go out to the landscape on a bicycle. I, I have a flying boat now. It was after the war. My father came home for lunch one day and he said, we're leaving, we're getting out of here. And uh, within a week we were on, a, on the old Aquitania and we're sailing across the Atlantic to Halifax. From Halifax, he made his way to Ontario, um, where he met Mary Burroughs and had two kids. Then Tony's wife died. He went to Mexico and uh, there he found himself in a place where it was cheap to live. San Miguel was a sort of artist colony. When I was living in Mexico, I painted for a full year just doing Mexican landscapes and I just hated them. And one day I tore everything up and it was scattered all over my studio floor. And then I looked down and I saw these papers laying one on top of the other and I saw shapes and, and patterns and things emerging that would have broken my arm, you know, five minutes before to paint that, actually. So I pick about three pieces of paper up, you know, together, and I pin them to another piece of paper on the wall. And before I knew it, I'd created something entirely different. I mean, these were abstract collages. The rest of my two years' stay in Mexico, I was doing collages.
When I came back to Vancouver, I mean, nobody's seen anything like this, and I was sort of an instant hit in a way. I'm very fond of the, and I think they're very important works, the, the early abstractions. I think he was producing work that was amongst the most interesting that was being produced in, in Canada. It was, it was bought by the Tate Gallery. It was, it was recognized as being very significant. What he was able to do was take works of art that he didn't think were really particularly succeeding and sort of rip them up and uh, sort of move them around and then find ways where they had a certain degree of dynamic tension on the surface of the image and then glue it all down and then create you know pure abstractions that don't have a particular narrative sense to them. After I'd sold a few of these uh, paper on paper collages um, I had enough money I could go out and buy canvas. I mean for the first time I had I, I had the uh, canvas in my possession. I did a whole series of, of uh, canvas collages This early collage work, I guess you could say it reached its, its apex with his mural in 1962, which he did for the Playhouse. It was the largest thing he did. He had trouble getting it out of his studio. He had to actually cut it into three pieces and have it move from that studio. In the summer of 2002, the Arborean Cultural Center in Coquitlam staged an exhibition of Tony's collages. We were particularly interested in showing the work that went back almost 50 years in comparison with what was being done today. And beyond that, we wanted to show some of the work that is not uh, typically seen. You could see um, a thread that ran through uh, over the years, which were distinctively uh, his palette, uh, his strong sense of design, and they were unmistakably Tony's works. The attitude that goes into my collages goes into my watercolors. It's the same. I don't see any big difference, except with one, I'm dealing with a subject matter. With the other, I'm dealing with pure abstract form. I'm probably better known for my 60s work where I'm dealing with one or two shapes and that sort of thing and playing around them like a, a chess game relating to the framed edge of the painting sort of thing, you know. Uh, I, I still do that in my paintings, even my landscape paintings now. I'm concerned about the relationship between the edge of the painting and what's happening in the painting and getting a spark between the, the shapes in the painting. Where Onley is interesting is he never became a realist. He always retains a certain degree of abstraction, of distance within those landscapes, and gives it a more timeless kind of quality. The use of color on his watercolor palette in particular is very directly connected to the nature of the landscape in which he's depicting. It's cool, but it's warm at the same time. It's inviting at the same time, encourages you to enter into that landscape with him. My experience in painting comes from the light in this area, you know, the black light of British Columbia, which I love, you know. The lakes look like they're bottomless, the black water. I love that northern light, as opposed to the sort of the white light of early morning in, in California. The light is on the surface. The light doesn't penetrate. Ghosts can't live in California, but they can live in our forests. This is where my, where my sort of soul is here. And I respond to that northern temperament. It's the timeless things that I'm looking for all the time. It's the things that don't date, the things that are there now and have always been there. And this is what feeds my heart. That commitment to watercolor is rather unusual in terms of the strength and depth of that commitment because often for other artists it's been a fairly subsidiary aspect of their activity, but for Onley it's been a very major and central aspect of his activity. There has always been historically a feeling that watercolors are lesser things somehow. Um, and I think that you know Onley's commitment to watercolor is indicated that really they're not lesser things. Tony only has modernized uh, the technique of watercolor. We can say that he is widely influenced by Oriental art. For example, the empty space is as important as the spaces that are filled. It is extremely powerful. 
the other would be Japanese calligraphy and mostly the tools used by artists. And you know, we have all seen these beautiful Japanese brushes that he's using. Um, so there is an Oriental feeling. It's mingling the, the Western tradition with the Oriental tradition. He felt something in common between his own aesthetic and also Japanese traditional aesthetics. I'm talking about Zen aesthetic, which to do with simplicity and minimalism, actually a lot to do with empty space. Japanese are very good at emphasizing empty space. Japanese painters, they don't draw before they paint. I mean, for one thing, they're working on rice paper, you know, and they're reacting to what's happening as it's happening on the paper. They, they may um, sit and contemplate the blank sheet of paper for a while, which I do. Mostly the scale of what I'm about to do. You know, well, I sit and look at a landscape like that for a long time and then decide what I'm going to select out of it. You know? And I pay attention to the light and the weather and, uh, and mostly I'm trying to capture the light, you know, and the objects in the painting are just objects to shine the light on. The watercolors, they are so caught on the fly, and yet they function best as a personal object of contemplation. And this, to my mind, is, is where, where Tony's sort of Asian sensibility comes in. The idea of not public artwork, but private objects that you keep close to you. Everything is very muted, very serene, tranquil. It definitely has an oriental um, flavor to it, and he's the absolute consummate expert at this type of uh, painting. But they have a very spiritual quality, and being a musician, I, you know, that uh, resonates with me. It's a very Japanese way of painting. It's, you know, they call it the song of the brush. The dab of paint goes on, and it stays there, and that's it. There's no messing around. It's done, and it stands there, it's delicious, and everybody loves it. Tony has his own style. It's, it's very distinctive. You recognize a Tony only as soon as you see it. It's not, it's not a picture postcard. It's a, it's a beautiful evocation of a place. Those are the things that make Tony uh, popular. He's the poet of, of the landscape. He's the poet of the West Coast mists, is what he is. Landscape is the starting point. And there are, there are, what's intriguing about his work, I think, is that he frequently moves to an extremely pictorial style. Other times, we're looking at great washes of color um, and uh, form, which are almost completely abstract. But the purpose of it being there is not because he saw a log there, but, but because that particular form belongs in that particular painting. The key thing is the way the artist's eye sees the landscape and the way in which the artist's hand follows the artist's imagination in interpreting the landscape. As soon as you put a mark on the paper, you, you've narrowed down all your possibilities right there, you know, and that determines the, the next area you're going to paint, and that determines the next, so you're constantly looking. So at the end of the day, you have something you could, could never have thought of in the morning. To me, this is the huge thrill of painting. My work emerges as I'm painting. It's emerging, and the painting tells me when it's finished. It says, you know, Tony, don't go any further. I might be in a mid-stroke, and I, that's it. You know, you've got to be making value judgments as you're going all the time. you just got to feel it, you know. Don't think of the end. Think of where you are right now at this very second where you are right now and where that's telling you to go in the next second and the next second until the painting screams at you. Tony, put the brush down, you're finished. <laughs> Tennessee Williams had written a play based on Chekhov's The, the Seagull. Tony, who was having a colossal amount of visibility and success at the time, was asked to design the sets. Williams came in August of that year, 1981. As soon as he saw the set, he said, who designed this set? 
And of course, this led to a meeting with Tony, and uh, the two became friends. Each time the curtain came up on a new scene, it was a brand new scene. The lighting engineer was obviously brilliant, and he'd taken suggestions from Tony about, you know, how the basic set could be altered to capture the mood of each scene. That was one of the most dramatic and breathtaking um, and beautiful um, stage experiences, theater experiences that I've had. The thing about Tony is that he realizes what a lot of visual artists don't realize, and that's that you have to promote yourself. You're competing against detergent. You're competing against conflicts for public attention. Tony was very much interested in producing uh, art which, which could be sold and which was sold. And uh, at that point, he, thought, he felt that he was separated by an increasingly wide gulf from the art community. The idea of producing saleable work is, is, is a kind of anathema. Some people say, well, it was a typical, typical Canadian reaction that Canada has a problem uh, with the success of its own people. It's only when they get huge recognition outside Canada that Canadians will take somebody's success seriously. Probably the thing that thrilled him more than anything was they decided to put some of Tony's landscapes of the Isle of Man onto stamps, quite big, grand, beautiful stamps, which were very highly sought after collector's pieces. He was absolutely delighted when he was awarded the Order of Canada, which was a bit of a snub on the nose to uh, the local sour pusses. Tony really was pleased about that uh, because he felt that Canada had been exceptionally good to him. There was a lot of sniping, a lot of carping, and a lot of, uh, a lot of um, jealousy, uh, which was unnecessary. Uh, Tony fanned the flames. He did delight in uh, fanning the flames. Driving around in his Rolls Royce, uh, flaunting his wealth. He was an ostentatious painter. Uh, people think, well, he can't be a very good painter. He's, he's just a promoter. In fact, he's not that. Uh, he's, a, he's a painter in his own right, and the promotion is simply a recognition of the fact that you've got to get out there and sell. The Arctic was a place I always wanted to go to. Um, for years and years, I wanted to go there and paint. I mean, it's, a, it's part of the Canadian consciousness. And very few Canadians have actually been to their Arctic. Uh, it's, it's a realm of the imagination. It's our great outdoors, our great backyard. It's the space that we have that we value so much. It was in, I think, about 1972. I was on holidays in New Brunswick, and um, my host said, oh, guess who's coming to dinner tonight? And it was Pierre Trudeau and Margaret. I'd known him before he was in politics. And he said to me, he said, you know, your, your art always reminded me of the Arctic. And I said, well, I've always wanted to go there, but I don't know how to get there. You know, you can't get there from here. There, nothing goes there. And uh, he said, well, leave that with me. Pierre yeah, Trudeau was very interested in Tony's work and saw an opportunity of bringing Tony to the Arctic and, in other words, bringing the Arctic to Canada. April 10th, 1974. My dear Onley, I have wonderful news for you. Am I not right in believing that travel to Baffin Island by sea would in fact be a far preferable option for you and that it would enable you to sketch northern and arctic scenes on the way there and back? All the best, uh, very sincerely, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. It's very, very exciting uh, painting in the Arctic, and there's no distractions. There's, you know, I have nothing to do except paint, you know. My landscapes are pretty well ready-made for me up there. You know, it's just like, I just have to look around and, wow, there's a spot, you know, there's the, you know, there's a painting right there, you know, sort of thing, so. When you're moving through icebergs, I mean, that is magical because 
It's like sculpture, it changes its form as you're going around it, you know. So I'd be painting madly, you know, you're trying to get this down, get it down before, well, it's in my mind, before, before I lose it. I've done 20 paintings a day, you know, because it's 24 hours of daylight, so I just keep on going, you know, and I remember one time I got so un involved with my painting and I turned around and there was one guy on watch on the bridge and I said, well, where is everybody? He said, it's three o'clock in the morning, everybody's in bed. <laughs> I remember the captain saying to me, uh, well, you know, everybody on the ship's wondering what you're painting, and the guys below deck, they don't see what I'm painting. He said, how would you like to give the crew a show? And uh, so I was showing them my paintings, and one of the crew members said, well, you know, I've been coming up here for 30 years, and it's all white, you know, where do you get these blues and pinks and these colors, you know? I mean, there's no color up here, you know? So I gave them a lesson in perception. I said, you look over here, and you'll see that the shadows are all sort of a mauve blue color. You look over here and it tends towards pink, actually, you know, and they look and say, I can't see that, you know. I said, well, tuck your head under your arm and look, and you'll, you'll, you'll be able to see it, and you can. If you look upside down to a landscape, you can see the colors, and you can see the scale of things, too. So the bosun's mate sort of looked out there and he looked the other way. He said, oh my God, he's right. God, it's all blue out there. You know, I never realized that before, you know, and they all got very excited. And <clears throat> the next day I was passing the, uh, the captain's office and uh, he says, Tony, <clears throat> come in here, shut the door. You know, so, oh my God, what have I done? He said, ever since you talked to my crew, he said about visual conception, he says, They've been going around with a head you know where. <laughs> that was great. <laughs>Printmaking has been an extraordinary activity for Onley. Um, he has, is one of the most distinguished printmakers who's ever worked in British Columbia. Working with Bill Bonneman, he was able to create these remarkably luminous and translucent kinds of uh, uses of ink, which, which affect the kind of image that looks sort of like a watercolor, even though it's a screen print. And this kind of richness of, of, of color and subtlety of color that occurs in these prints is something that really marks him as being a very particular and important printmaker in this part of the world. Salt screening is a screen process, sorography, whatever you want to call it. It's one of the oldest methods around. It's basically uh, putting a stencil down, whatever stenciled off, the rest of it is all, the surface gets covered. It's basically a process of resistance. Whatever you'd want to print, you take out. We'd look at his, uh, one of his watercolors or format the same way as he might look at a landscape. Then what happened is that's a point of derivation. We'd do a few little cuts, establish something, put it away, and then uh, occasionally be mesmerized by how far gone we went. You know, we hardly even recognize the original idea. And the whole point of it was that's where the poetry was.
Bill Barneyman was a very fine printmaker. I mean, we started making screen prints together, roughly based on compositional ideas out of watercolors, although I couldn't sort of copy the watercolor because the medium is quite different. But what I was interested in getting um, uh, was a medium that was transparent, you know, like watercolor, where you lay one color on top of another and you create a third and a fourth and a, and a fifth color. You create a lot of different colors just by a couple of printings, you can do that. We'll print this whole area along here and right down through here, up through here following this line, right around the river. This will all be yellow. Then we'll print the sky. That'll be the second printing, will be the sky. Bill used to say, you know, you can screen anything. I mean, that's what clued me in. He said, you can screen porridge if you want, you know. I said, oh, God, we don't have to use screen ink. We can make our own ink. So I started, you know, making, mixing my own ink and that kind of thing. I, I certainly enjoyed making them, you know, because I never knew what it was going to look like when I finished it. Very much like the painting, we would keep going with it and, and changing it and uh, adding things to it. Uh, I just keep going until the, till, till it, it happened. It's just like doing one painting, except it's in multiples, you know, to multiple images. Um. That's a thing of beauty, a joy forever. <laughs> <laughs> Western Canada Wilderness Committee, they phoned me and uh, they had uh, a problem with the Stein Valley at the time. I mean, this is a valley where uh, young natives would, would go to, um, to find their spiritual animal. You know, they would go uh, when they were teenagers and, and uh, climb up into caves and sort of starve themselves and have visions and, until they saw the animal that would guide their life sort of thing. And then they'd draw it on the cave wall. I mean, I flew in a helicopter up the, up the face of this cliff, and it was this one cave was just full of animal drawings done in red ochre on the, on the walls that, like for hundreds of years, animals painted over animals, that kind of thing. It was quite a w wonderful sight. So it was a spiritual home, you know, to, to the Lillooet Indians. So when you see it from the air, as I do, I, I could see that everything around there for miles and miles had already been logged off. Your opponents, the timber companies, are some of the most politically powerful and wealthy organizations in the country. So how, how, can, you, how can you go up, how can you even hope to go up against uh, a big powerful timber company? And I said, what I'll do is get together a group of artists uh, and maybe get some uh, fellow pilots or people that I know with float planes who will fly up there and uh, we'll spend a weekend up in the valley and we'll come back and we'll have an exhibition of the paint and paintings and we'll have a black tie dinner and we'll, we'll do it all at the Hyatt Regency or something and we'll, we'll make a big statement, uh, draw awareness to the problem, but at the same time we'll sell paintings. At $3,000 on this Tony, only watercolor going for $3,000. It's going what, thirty-two fifty, sir, thank you, and the thirty-five and the thirty-five. Artists in Canada generally work from nature. I mean, we're nature-oriented in this country, but particularly in British Columbia. So with Tony coming involved with this and bringing in a whole community of communicators, artists, I mean, this, this took the Stein issue and really, and put it on the map. And 3250, it's only money, and it's for a wonderful cause. <laughs> it was very good, and I got all these uh, Western Canada wilderness people into monkey suits. <laughs> well, Tony's um, monkey suit idea really taught me a lot. I learned that we're essentially tribal, and that we have, all have our tribal dress that we feel comfortable in. So that when Tony suggested we go out and get tuxedos, <laughs> 